Recent or stain? Yeah. <laughs> I don't need it. I will play with my bare hands. We're on second thought. <laughs> <laughs> friends, how are you? I'm Mario Thurger and today I'm going to talk about Thor. I thought starting the month of July with Thor would be fitting. I don't know how nature behaves where you are, but in here July is the month of thunder. Usually it's 24 out of 31 days with thunderstorms. Well, uh, Thor spends summer on this part of the planet, uh, during this season at least, and also because it's my birthday during this month, so Thor remembers and pays his usual yearly visit and gives me unwanted presents like burning a tree that I like or electricity goes down and it's absolutely impossible for me to work. Well, you know, absolute menace. Anyway, throughout this video I will pronounce Thor uh, for the sake of understanding but um, it would be actually easier for me to pronounce Tour, uh, then make thing a tour, uh, as this is how I was introduced to this deity in the modern uh, Scandinavian languages, of course, uh, namely Swedish and Norwegian, uh, by a professor of mine during my childhood. But I know it's down, it sounds strange like that, so better keep it with the old Norse pronunciation <laughs> as best as possible, Thor. Also, my research on Thor, um, especially in the past three years or so, has led me to several conclusions, so I've come to realize that I cannot make one single video on Thor, so I have decided to start with a brief introduction, which is uh, this video right here you are about to watch today, and I'll briefly speak about several important points, I think they are important points, in relation to Thor, which I think are fundamental to have a general idea concerning this Old Norse deity. So on this video today it's really just and only <laughs> an introduction. Uh, and several points that shall be discussed here today, I shall develop them in more depth in future videos, whenever. <laughs> All the videos shall have as main title the cult of Thor, so you might know that it shall be the continuation of this theme, but always with a different second title addressing the main subject. Future videos concerning the etymology of the name, as an example, uh, specific mythological accounts involving Thor, which require a sole focus or a deeper analysis to try to understand a whole other aspect of religion and cult associated with Thor. Comparisons with other deities, of course, uh, death cult, thunder cult, goat cult, war, fertility, magic, feminine magic as well, which is quite important, and so on and so forth. Several videos in the future concerning Thor. And speaking of introduction, this video today needs an introduction to the introduction. So 
I'll start from there, right? Because I think we should have in mind a couple of aspects concerning uh, Thor uh, to better understand this deity and the cults and religious importance associated to this deity. If we understand the, let's say, the essence of Thor and the powers associated to this deity, as well as iconography, the main myths and um, his relationship with humankind, everything else will make a lot more sense and the pieces will sort of come together. And um, as I said on other videos, mythology is not religion. However, mythology, more often than not, is constructed to explain, understand and memorize ritual behavior. So it's really important to reflect on the most expressed behaviors and ideas in the myths surrounding Thor, to capture as best as possible, of course, the significance of Thor in the Old Norse pre-Christian Scandinavian mentality. And again, this is just an introduction for now, so calm down, Many things will be left unsaid on purpose because there are certain cultural factors that need a deeper analysis, which I shall do on future videos. Otherwise, uh, we would be in here, or at least without a doubt, this would be over 30 hours of video content. So with no more delay, please, let's get started, my dear friends. We have many Old Norse myths concerning Thor. I would even dare saying the great amount of myths concerning Thor makes him second only to Odin and Loki, although the three gods often come together in the myths. Although in terms of religion, uh, well, especially the religious manifestations of pre-Christian Southern Sweden during the late Iron Age, it was usually Odin, Thor and Freud. Loki not having been considered an actual deity, but crucial as the trickster spirit in folk magic and Nordic animistic relationships. But indeed, Thor was quite popular. One of the most popular gods, if not the most important and popular deity, especially by the end of the Viking period, around the 9th and the 10th centuries of the Common Era, of course, in Scandinavia. But of all the myths involving Thor, there's a theme that is more frequent, which marks the, let's say, the major function of Thor. Giant killing. Thor is a giant slayer. His field of expertise is killing giants, which is very curious, actually. Thor has been for far too long understood as a solely a warrior deity whose function was to protect the realm of the gods and mankind from giants, from the Jotnar. And that these Jotnar, these giants, are evil creatures and must be slaughtered at all costs, uh, for they pose a constant threat to the orderly creation of the gods. Even though I'm not completely discarding that idea, uh, and indeed, uh, there's some truth in it to a certain extent, of course. I think this is oversimplifying things and the actual purpose of both Thor and giants is often veiled by the constant image that the Vikings were a warrior people only concerned with aspects of battle, death and conflict and as such their mythology represents a very warlike understanding of a society and as such that also reflects on their entire perceptions of the world and several other realities. This is obviously an erroneous idea because uh, well, that's a, a, th there's a bigger focus on the Vikings and not so much on the late Iron Age and Middle Ages, uh, Middle Ages Scandinavian societies from which Vikings came from. Vikings obviously not being a people, but an activity within a vast society in which the great majority of its people were actually farmers and not warriors and not Vikings or at least not Vikings all the time as being a Viking was much more of a seasonal activity rather than a full-time job. So when past historians and, and some modern historians actually uh, 
have focused or continue to focus too much on the activity of Viking. Everything else within the pre-Christian Scandinavian societies were seen from that point of view. And that has completely overshadowed the rich culture that was the foundation of the Norse myths. And as such, uh, Thor has been seen from uh, the point of view of the activity of Vikings, of going Viking instead of focusing on the social, political, religious and economic realities of pre-Christian Scandinavia, especially by the end of the Viking period. So, Thor is a giant slayer, he himself being half a giant, as he is the son of Jorb, the earth, a giantess per se, a, a female Jotnar. Almost all of Thor's myths are associated with giant slaying, and even those whose contents also represent other aspects of religion, ritual behavior, cult and animistic perceptions, one way or another shows Thor's predisposition in fighting against giants, being a force that opposes the giants. So we must start from there. Let's take into consideration the giants, the Jotnar, for a moment. Something I have briefly talked about before on another video, but I will certainly do a video solely on the Jotnar someday. But even so, a, a couple of aspects must be pointed out. The Jotnar, the, the giants of Norse mythology, are actually the most important beings alongside the gods themselves. Giants play a major role in the Norse cosmogony. And the gods always have dealings with giants. The giants are entities from whom the gods not only descended from, but the gods often require something that belongs to the giants, or require specific giants as powers and tools and magical powers the gods use for their own benefit and to maintain their orderly creation in place. And it seems that the giants have been viewed in some way as beings of nature, embodiments of the natural elements and the natural phenomena. They represent everything in the natural world that stands outside the orderly circle of human society and culture. As such, they do represent the real dangers and threats of the natural world. From, from which humankind can hardly escape from. As such, they appear in opposition to the gods in the Norse myths. The gods being the agents, creators of order and protection, the entities towards whom humans require protection from or some sort of beneficial relationship is created between mankind and gods in order to protect the human community from the dangers, disasters, destruction, and even death the natural elements can provoke. The giants not only are the embodiment of natural phenomena and the elements, but they are also part of the supernatural beings of nature, entities of place, in an animistic worldview understood as the persons of a particular landscape feature, such as a mountain, a field, a river, a forest, or better still, places and natural phenomena endowed with personhood. In this way, Thor, being the giant slayer, a god constantly in conflict with giants, he is the god that fights against natural elements and phenomena. And an aspect of order the human society turns to in times of need when nature acts in a way that causes harm to the human society. Thor was a god of protection, a god of fertility of the soils, animals and people, a god of thunder. Not just as the personification of thunder, as a contributing factor for the fertility of the land that often brings the rains to fertilize the soils, but also the weather phenomenon endowed with personhood that at times can be very unpredictable and cause more devastation than something beneficial. And indeed, in the myths, Thor is very unpredictable and he doesn't measure his own strength and rapidly loses control of, of 
his own force, at times causing more devastation than, pun than putting things in order as initially intended. But he was a god people trusted nonetheless. People often swore oaths by invoking Thor. So when nature acted up, humans called upon Thor to put things back in order, as he was the only god whose powers were capable of withstanding the very powers of nature. Thor himself being half-giant, half a phenomenon of nature, thunder. His power and might was necessary to protect the human society against giants, that is, against the natural forces of the world. I promise this will make more sense as we go. If we remember that the, let's say, the primordial aspects of Norse spirituality and ritual behavior were based on animistic concepts, the gods were spirits of place or region or important geographic features, relevant reliefs in the landscape, places understood as being endowed with personhood, persons of the world, ancestors of the tribe, forces of nature, etc. Of course, the religious and mythological conceptions change a lot over time, simply because we humans, uh, human beings, uh, mold all these concepts to adapt to our new social realities and needs. Thor was not a deity originally from Scandinavia, not as a god of the Aesir and a warrior god solely, uh, because such a character in Thor was introduced in Scandinavia in the migration period, possibly. And certainly, to this Germanic deity, it was also included several other characteristics of local deities, and throughout the ages, the image of Thor began to reflect other specific needs of each era, of each period. However, Thor came to become one of the most important gods and uh, be included in the group of the Aesir, and even having his father, the god Odin, due to political and religious changes of various eras or various periods. I think Thor was not originally of the Aesir. In fact, the concept of Aesir and a, a clear division between uh, the gods or tribes of gods was created later on in a context outside mainland Scandinavia. Thor during the, the Viking Age was clearly the most popular god in Scandinavia because he was the god of the people, so to speak. He was the god of the Thrall, the Thralar, of, of, of slaves and, and servants, the social group with the least power and the fewest possessions within the Viking Age Scandinavian society. In fact, in the Eddic poem Harbard's Song, says that Odin takes the nobles who fall in battle and Thor takes the Thrall, the slaves. So we know there was a conception of an afterlife place for the enslaved, which apparently were taken by the storm god Thor, or would eventually inhabit in the afterlife governed by Thor. Thor was also the god of farmers, blacksmiths, artisans, fishermen, well, in short, the general population and not so much of the elite. He definitely was not a deity of the elite and other uh, social classes with considerable social status, but a god of the vast majority of the population, of farmers, fisher folk, uh, producers and in general and and those who provided services right the scandinavian elite mainly in norway and sweden during the viking age would worship odin the most but of course thor was also the most popular as he was the deity of the largest number of people who constituted scandinavian uh, society in medieval times of course, in Sweden, they worshipped Freyr a lot more, as Freyr was indeed the god of the Swedes, but until the arrival of the cult of Thor, of course, which quickly became very popular, popular <laughs> for the same reasons uh, as previously pointed out. A deity as popular as Thor had to be brought into the Aesir group or tribe of gods at some time politically, religiously and hierarchical quite different in a way in which the divine sphere itself had to be represented just like the hierarchization of society at that time. 
Certainly, Thor did not originally belong to the High Seer, and in fact, I have my doubts about being Odin's son, since in the mythological tales after the Viking Age, and mostly in the 13th century, especially uh, what the Icelandic Snorri Sturluson composed, virtually all the gods are children of Odin, because Odin came to be characterized as the old father, Alfadir, equating him with the Judeo-Christian god. Odin was originally god of death in the old, uh, to the old uh, Germans, continental Germans, and did not exist in Scandinavia until the introduction of his cult <laughs> at a later time during the Iron Age. Thor, on the other hand, was known in Scandinavia probably, probably before Odin, if we take into account that the, the Germanic Thor was associated, or better still, merged together with other prehistoric Scandinavian deities. He is a very primitive god, indeed, historically speaking, of course, in relation to the existence of humanity and uh, its uh, relationship with uh, magical religious concepts. Odin is relatively new on the religious scene as a god of death. As a god, king and father of the gods, or the divine father in general, it's a, con a conception even more recent, probably late 10th century in continental Scandinavia and throughout the 13th century in Icelandic medieval times. Death has always existed, of course, but the first deities we know related to death are female. Odin arrives later as a god uh, of, of battle-related death. Odin is specifically the god of death, but death in war and god of the dead in battle, in the battlefield, not death and the dead in general. Thor, on the other hand, is a force of nature. He is the order and chaos of the storm, and his strength is the power of heaven over earth, or the sky phenomenon over the earth. Thor and his cult... When they are introduced in Scandinavia, Thor really begins to lose the status of warrior deity to become one of fertility. We know that Thor is also linked to the cult of the dead, and we know that later on, already in Iceland, of course, the vast majority of Norwegian settlers and colonizers and the pre-Christian Icelanders, upon death, they counted or they expected on going to the place where Thor presided in the other world. This was most likely because Thor was considered the deity of the common people, as previously mentioned. The god of the majority of the population, the farmers and the craftsmen, slaves, who constituted the vast majority of the Scandinavian and Icelandic populations. The vast majority of medieval Scandinavian social classes were waiting to go to Thor. We know that the cult of the dead is closely linked or intimately tied to the cult of fertility. And of course, Thor is a god linked to fertility. His powers that preside over the heavens, uh, rain, thunder, um, thunderstorm in general, which bring fertility to the earth. Thor's own mother is Jord, a giantess or an earth goddess. One of the most famous myths of Thor is his struggle to fish out the great serpent Jormungandr from the sea and uh, how he tries to unknowingly lift the serpent uh, at Utgard, another account, almost breaking the entire order of life. And I, I think at some point, at some prehistoric time before the Iron Age, well, certainly before the Viking Age, uh, at least before the 9th century, Maybe Thor and Jormungandr were linked to the cult of the fertility of the earth as two forces working together to bring about the fertility of the soils. In part, it reminds me of the Celtic god Sukellos, uh, who with his great hammer beats the earth to give to it fertility and wake up fertility in the earth, fertilizing the soils with his great hammer. We see this aspect of this Celtic god brought into Thor. Perhaps the pounding of Thor's hammer into the earth causes the serpent to surface, provoking or distributing its fertility powers all over the surfaced world. 
Let's not forget that the serpent symbol, the serpent iconography in Iron Age Scandinavia is closely linked to female deities and quite often associated with female magical cults, uh, cults and uh, female society, women's society, especially associated with underworld female deities who hold the power of fertility. And Thor's hammer itself reveals a very phallic shape. So perhaps this connection existed, a relationship between Thor and the serpent, the great serpent, that is a male and a female aspect, and together these polarities form life, an aspect of fertility. And perhaps Thor actually hunted or fished the great serpent, but not in the sense of Jormungandr being an animal representing evil, as this representation is only conceived in a later period with Christianity. But precisely Thor pulling the great serpent to force it to give fertility, pulling it out of the earth, hitting it with his hammer or pulverizing the earth with his powers over the storm, rain fertilizing the soils. Or perhaps the relationship between the two was friendlier, as Thor's mother is the earth, so perhaps Thor was in contact with his mother or the earth's animal totem being the serpent. Still, there's a clear connection here between Thor and, uh, and feminine Teutonic deities. Let's not forget that Thor's wife is Sif, a deity that seems to be a complementary element in the cult of Thor when Thor played a major role as a fertility deity. Sif was used as a canning for gold and the golden color, including a reference to her beautiful hair as being golden in color. This may be in reference to vegetation, namely wheat. Bear it with me. In Skaldskaparmal, Loki cuts the hair of Sif out of pure malice. When Thor knows about this, he is ready to harm Loki for what he has done. But Loki had sworn to have the black elves to make new hair for Sif, which would grow like normal hair, and this time the hair done by the black elves was made out of pure gold. And pay close attention at this. This, this is very interesting, because if we remember uh, uh, the video I have done about Loki, uh, in Scandinavian folklore, to this day, actually, especially in Denmark, Loki remains the spirit of warmth and heat, a spirit who helps farmers during summertime. He is the spirit of heat, a weather spirit, which during summer burns too hot and may destroy the crops. But also, his help as a weather spirit isn't just in relation to heat. Loki is indeed a spirit related to fire, the hearth, and the burning of the fields for fertility purposes. If Sif is wheat, Loki cutting her hair is literally the burning of the crops, and Thor, being the fertility deity, is furious for having lost the hair of his wife, losing the, cor the crops, losing the wheat he fertilized, destroyed by heat and fire. Loki asks the black elves to make a new hair. In the near future I shall speak about the black elves or, or the dark elves, but suffice it to say for now that these elves, Okfar, are literally spirits of the land, of the soils, of the under, underworld, the underground, who were considered to have power over fertility. These dark elves are often associated with the Twergar, the dwarves, entities of the land associated with the underground and its riches, namely precious metals. Hence, making new sieves hair out of pure gold. But they have power over the fertility of the soils of the land. So they help the crops to regrow. They help wheat to regrow. So in this myth, we have a series of fertility aspects. Thor, Sif, Loki, and the Dark Elves or Black Elves. God of fertility, wheat, fire and heat, and the fertility powers of the soils, respectively. Thor's relationship with Loki is also very interesting. Thor is the, the only god capable of shutting Loki up in the poem Loka Sena, as an example. One of the most frequent companions of Thor is Loki, and Thor does have, to a certain extent, of course, 
um, a certain control over Loki, as seen in the previous account about Sif losing her hair, and Thor forces Loki to make amends. In fact, Thor is also the one who contributes the most to the capture of Loki that leads to his ultimate binding. Thor is indeed the only god who has any sort of control over the trickster spirit Loki. Thor is thunder, lightning, and the Loki, if you remember my video on Loki, he is the trickster spirit of fire. Lightning creates fire, so there's a certain control over its creation by thunder, but once fire is lit and set loose, there's little thunder or anything else can do, except, of course, the thunderstorm bringing rain to quench the fire, binding fire. And Loki's father is Thorbauti, a giant whose name means something between the lines of dangerous hitter, cruel striker, or sudden striker, in relation to lightning or storm, the force of nature that can create fire. But more on that on another video. And if this explanation isn't enough, let's not forget about Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. Thor's hammer was named Mjolnir, and a name that literally means grinder, in relation to the grinding of grains to produce flour. Flour, as you know, a powder obtained by grinding grain. Grinding grain, sorry. Uh, typically wheat, precisely. Sif. Remember, Thor was the god of farmers and the god of crops and fertility. Again, Mjolnir as the grinder of grains and its very suggestive phallic shape. And the idea of masculinity over the feminine powers of the earth and vice versa, of course. And as said before, Thor is associated with feminine magic and fertility, as well as symbols of female magic, power and goddesses of the earth and women's society in general. The first representations of Thor's hammer, Mjolnir, do not appear in the Scandinavian peninsula as a geographical uh, reality, right? But in fact, in Saxon context and later on Danish context. In Denmark, Thor's hammers are mainly found in female graves, women's graves. Literally, the, the great majority of people who used Thor's hammer around their necks were women. And if this isn't enough, we return to the idea of Thor fighting giants. Remember, giants are the natural phenomenon and forces of nature, mainly of the earth and the soils, of the landscape. Mountains, hills, rivers, and as we have seen, Thor's contact with giants not only is the attempt by the god himself to control the powers of nature, the natural phenomenon, but also his very real connection with the forces of nature. Thor being the, the thunderstorm whose powers are both harmful and beneficial. Thunderstorm bringing destruction, but also fertilizing the soils with fire and rain. Most giants who were victims of Thor's wrath were not male giants, but in fact female giants, giantesses. During the last centuries of paganism in Iceland, some poets left us with two important fragments of poems addressed directly to Thor, which are mostly lists of giants he has killed some of the giants are known from uh, other sources and, and other periods, uh, others not so much, which, uh, which is possibly from lost accounts or, or from folklore. But the curious thing is that in this great list of Thor's victims, most of them are composed of female names. Most of Thor's killing, or in other words, most of these gods' interactions with uh, interactions with giants was with female entities, as the forces of nature and chaos, and the underworld and the earth itself have always had a strong female side and uh, and, and feminine characteristics, and perhaps this tells us a thing or two about the cross-dressing aspect of Thor in the myth of the theft of his hammer of his manhood, where he 
dresses as a bride to recover his stolen hammer from a giant, his stolen manhood. But that is, that is a tale for another time, of course. Uh, but in any case, now that I remember, I've made a video concerning the number nine in Old Norse religion. Uh, if you have the time, of course, wa do watch it, please. <laughs> As the number nine not only is often associated with pagan magic, but mostly associated with women's magic and women's magical, magical cults and societies. And, and there's a tremendous amount of accounts involving male gods and male heroes and the number nine and these male characters or entities um, shifting their gender in order to access the feminine magic and power literally becoming women in order to access the powers and magic of female giantess giants and giantesses and goddesses but that, that's the case for another time in relation to thor and his gender identity shift there's also another important aspect we should mention as well uh, as I said, Thor was the god of the people, of farmers and um, others whose function uh, in, in the Scandinavian society was mainly production and providing services. He was the most popular god, the god beloved by humans. And how not? He was the provider of protection and the fertility god who was the cause of the well-being of the humans and the force that provided sustenance, being a god of fertility of the soils to produce food, fertility of animals and fertility of humans as well, a god related to the continuation of the cycle of life and sustenance to both maintain and preserve life, which makes him more of a Vanir god, actually. So, there was indeed a great connection between Thor and mankind, and being the most popular god and the one called upon more often. People were not, mind you, wearing Odin's spear on their necks. They were not wearing Freya's sheep or sword or, or a phallus or Freya's falcon cloak or Edun's apples. They were using Thor's hammer, a representation of a religious symbol that appeared precisely in a Saxon context first and in early Danish society by the contact with Christians. Thor's hammer appears as a religious response towards the crosses the Christians wore around their necks to represent their religion. And late Saxons and early Danes wanted to also show a representation of their most beloved and popular god as well, so it came to be Thor's hammer. <laughs> but that is something for another time, another video. The point here is that Thor was the most popular and beloved by humans, a god of mankind, of humankind, so to speak. As such, he is the only god whose companion in adventures is a human being, Tjolfi or Tjolfar. Thor very frequently travels in the company of his assistants, assistant, sorry, the human Tjolfi. And this relationship indicates precisely the close relationship between Thor and humans. And another important aspect often overlooked is that Thor is capable of crossing rivers quite frequently. There are many myths involving Thor and the crossing of rivers, natural boundaries of, or frontiers. And this is quite curious as Thor is often associated with water. Not just the myth of trying to fish out uh, the world serpent Jormungandr, or drinking the sea, but Thor often crosses water to reach places. Often this is interpreted as Thor crossing boundaries into the realms of giants, as he often spends his time among giants. Indeed, I agree that this clearly shows an aspect of this deity as an entity capable of transgressing or crossing over boundaries, although I do not think this is only to do with giants and giant slaying. If you remember my video concerning water, afterlife places in Old Norse religion, well, you already know where this is going. Water, be that a, a bog, lake, river, or the sea, in Old Norse religion, and indeed in many Nordic cultures, is often associated with death and the afterlife, literally having to cross water as a boundary to reach the other side, to reach the afterlife or the other world. 
and some burial mounds, physical uh, representations, or, or, uh, were, were, were purposely surrounded by water as a symbolic boundary between the society of the living and the burial mound as the, the physical symbolic representation of the realm of the dead. And many islands surrounded by water, right, were considered sacred and the realm of the dead or specific gods related to death. So Thor crossing rivers has a lot more meaning than just going out to fight off giants. As previously said, Thor was associated with death and being the most popular god, most people expected to go to Thor and his dwellings upon death, as Thor was the god of the great majority of the social classes, of the low, lower and the lowest of social classes in the Viking Age, the god of the people. So it wouldn't be just Thor crossing rivers, but quite possibly in relation to the cult of Thor, and in association with death and the afterlife, people would symbolically cross rivers or any body of water to reach Thor. Perhaps a symbolic enactment of carrying over a body of water, the dead bound to Thor. This happened in many ancient societies in relation to gods of death and the underworld or, or gods associated with the afterlife somehow literally crossing a body of water, usually a river, in a ceremonial procession to deliver the deceased to the respective deity on the other side of this body of water. So it wouldn't be far-fetched a similar ceremonial or religious act in the cult of Thor and crossing a body of water to carry the deceased to the afterlife realms or place of Thor. Again, mythology is not religion, but more often than not, mythology is created to explain and represent ritual behavior. So Thor in the myths, often crossing rivers, may be a mythological representation of real ritual behavior towards death and a specific afterlife realm. But of course, this association between Thor and rivers, or water in general, may also be the representation of the importance and the popularity of this god among humanity. Taking into account that water in pre-Christian uh, Nordic uh, religions is often associated with the realms of the afterlife and of the gods, Thor crossing the river is his way of transgressing the boundaries set by the gods. And as such, he has a direct contact with what lies beyond, which is the realms of humans, of humankind, and vice versa. Of course, humans crossing rivers to reach Thor, going beyond the boundary. Let's not forget that Thor is half god and half giant. Giants being the entities of the earth, of, of Midgard. So Thor is very much at home among mankind, as the earth is his mother and the earth is part of his condition. He is, after all, after all, a god of the storm, of thunder, a weather phenomenon, a natural force just like all giants. Crossing rivers is Thor existing between two worlds, two realities, the world of the living and the realm of the gods. Well then, uh, this was a, an introduction to the introduction, <laughs> specific key points I think uh, that are uh, important to take in mind. If, you, if we have in mind the previous information, we can certainly better understand everything else concerning Thor, I hope. <laughs> uh, so now uh, let's start our actual introduction to the cult of Thor, shall we? <laughs> Are you still in there? Well, better get something to drink and eat to avoid perishing and being sent to Thor. Yes, I assume you are one of the common folk and not a lord or a lady or a king and a queen. I know the great majority of the audience I have are people after my own heart, the common folk, <laughs> the hard workers, farmers, uh, fisher folk, craftsmen, the endless producers and providers of services without whom our societies would surely fall. So yeah, 
Thor is uh, by far one of my favorites. I myself, having been raised on the countryside and very much a farmer during my childhood and teenage years, now, um, I never forget where you come from and your roots. Never be ashamed of your social background. Of course, some are born with great privilege. Others have to work hard for it, but none of them is at fault, really. Uh, the only problem is how we use the privilege the privilege we, we have born with or earned. So always be humble. But enough of that. Uh, let's continue uh, uh, this video. As said before, Thor is not a god originally from Scandinavia, although it's important to remember that the conception of gods don't necessarily have an original cultural point, since due to cultural syncretisms and syncretic faiths, the conceptions of gods move and change and evolve quite a lot, and there's always something new added to each deity, a new characteristic and power or field of expertise, depending on the culture that adopts or incorporates a deity in their belief systems. And also, of course, depending on the period. So, the Scandinavian Thor obviously had differences and almost a new character when the cult of this deity reached the north. Besides, we must also not forget that during the 7th century, the great majority of Scandinavians in the, again, the Scandinavian peninsula, still spoke Sami languages. Almost 80% of the territory was still composed by peoples who spoke Sami languages, meaning almost 80% of the territory, still in the 7th century, was still composed by Finno-Ugric peoples while the Germanic peoples were mainly composed, or sorry, compressed in the south of the territory. So when the cult of Thor finally reaches Scandinavia through the south, without a doubt, a lot of Finno-Ugric religious and cultural influences were incorporated in the figure of Thor. But that is something for another time. Perhaps the immediate thing we should explore for now is when and where did Thor first appear? Written records about a Germanic storm god, a Germanic storm god similar to Thor, appear before any iconographic uh, iconography was created to represent this god, Thor specifically. What I mean by this is that first came a written record concerning the deity that would become Thor eventually in the north in Scandinavia before people started to create any material culture to represent this deity, Thor, such as Mjolnir, uh, Thor's hammer, and the rune stones dedicated to Thor, or showing a type of iconography that transports us to mythology specifically involving Thor. So the earliest traces of Thor appear more or less about 700 years before the beginning of the Viking Age, or at least before the, the stipulated date understood to be the Viking Age, uh, as you know it, uh, which begins by the end of the 8th century. But written information concerning Thor appears in the 1st century of the Common Era, written by Tacitus on his famous book Germania. He wrote about a deity, the old continental Germans east of the Rhine worshipped. So not all Germanic peoples, but from a specific geographical area. This deity was called Donar, the god of thunder. Certainly there are many gods of thunder, but it is specifically Donar that would become Thor in Scandinavia. This thunder god carried a club, so Tacitus, like all the Romans of, of antiquity, equated Donar with something more familiar to him, which was Hercules. And this may constitute the very first problem when dealing with Thor, or in this case, when dealing with Donar, the deity that would become Thor eventually. Because Donar had a club as a weapon, that doesn't necessarily mean he is the same thing as Hercules. So many late historians have considered Thor 
as a warrior deity, solely a warrior deity, a big brute, but also a cultural hero, a warrior hero, because they were equating Donar with Hercules, just as Tacitus did. So Donar doesn't come to us actually from a Germanic perspective, but rather from a classical Roman perspective, which has had great influence until our modern days um, in the way we perceive Donar or Thor as a brute warrior god. He may have been so, of course, a warrior god, that is, but his other aspects are often neglected. What we know for sure is that he was a thunder god and had a club as a weapon, which in fact, among Germanic peoples of the late Iron Age and uh, throughout the Viking Age, in the north, of course, uh, within the cult of Thor, the victims sacrificed to this god were killed by being beaten to death with a club. <laughs> it's a sacrificial tool. Donar's association with thunder led, of course, to later Romans, uh, Roman writers equating him with Jupiter, the god that precisely throws thunderbolts, which further influenced the religious perception on Thor. So for many long centuries, until quite recently actually, Thor was seen as no more than a Germanic Jupiter or a, a cultural hero such as Hercules. And about two centuries before the, the period stipulated as the beginning of the Viking Age, the cult of Donar had already spread further north into Saxon land. And the Saxons brought with them their pagan religion and, along with it, they brought Thundor into the British Isles. The Saxon Donar, so to speak. This is most interesting, uh, the way I see it. <laughs> Not sure if you have been accompanying the latest research and uh, the archaeological works of the Sern Abbas giant, Britain's largest and best known Chalk Hill figure. Throughout the years, some have said he's Hercules. Local folklore has it as a local giant slain by villagers as he slept on the hill after a busy day eating their livestock. Over the centuries, this hill figure uh, has been uh, thought to be prehistoric, Celtic, Roman, even a 17th century creation. But in the past year, uh, through new analysis of the sediment, of course, this figure may in fact be of late Saxon period, possibly 10th century. And honestly, this starts to make a lot of sense. A figure wielding a club, and if it is indeed Saxon, this is none other than a depiction of Thunor. And notice the erected phallus, a sign of fertility aspects related to this figure. The old Saxons brought with them Thunor into the British Isles, and he was by far one of their most important and beloved deities. Now, Donar and or Thunor may have reached Scandinavia in an earlier period, probably migration period, Iron Age, or Scandinavians as Vikings, through that seasonal activity, taking to extremes the simple action of going out shopping, came in contact with Thunor upon invading the British Isles in the late 8th century and throughout the 9th and 10th centuries, bringing Thunor eventually into Scandinavia as Thor. However, Thunor has been a Saxon deity, so at least the Danes were already familiar with Thunor. And uh, to them, this was Thor. One way or another, it is perceptible that the cult of Thudor went from south to the north and reaching the Scandinavian peninsula at some point, probably around the 8th or 9th centuries. As said before, the earliest findings of Thor's hammer are found in Saxon context. Therefore, they also appear in Denmark first, before reaching further north into Sweden and Norway. And it is true, Thor in Scandinavia, especially for the Swedes, 
um, and, the, and, and the Norwegians only became a really important deity by the end of the Viking period, 10th and 11th centuries, also judging by the great amount of rune stones dedicated to Thor. Most of them are indeed from these periods, 10th and 11th centuries, especially the 11th century. Most rune stones were actually raised during the 11th century of the Common Era, of course, after Christianity had been accepted as the official religion. But returning to Cern Abbas, it's curious the erected phallus, as Thor was indeed a god of fertility, and his fertility aspects only increased in Scandinavia. Donar, and Thunor may have been more warlike figures, of course, and this characteristic wasn't totally lost when this cult reached Scandinavia, but without a doubt also related to fertility. Thus, these fertility aspects have had a greater religious focus in the belief systems of Scandinavians, as Thor to the Scandinavians had a lot more importance on fertility aspects of life, as seen by both written sources and folklore, and also, of course, mythology and archaeological findings related to the cult of Thor, especially Thor's hammer. A mighty warrior he may be, but in Scandinavia his qualities as a fertility god were a lot more sharpened, more striking, a weather god who brought rain to water the crops, fertilizing the crops with his seed. After all, his wife, Sif, may have been a fertility goddess, although I'm not so sure about it, but her golden hair represents bountiful harvests. Perhaps we should also spare a moment and, uh, and a few words uh, to, um, well, for now, of course, uh, to talk about the worshipping of Thor by Scandinavians of the early Middle Ages. Uh, there's not much we know about this from the few sources of the period, the great majority of written sources actually having been composed by early Christians in the north uh, who were hardly impartial concerning pagan matters, of course, including other Christians from continental Europe who came in contact with Scandinavians and um, and, and only saw fit to focus on the bloodthirsty accounts of human and animal sacrifices. Besides, it becomes harder to perceive because even though Scandinavians had temples, they did not have a religious structure whose foundations lied on specific canons, laws and holy books, nor there were religious authorities whose sole function was the pres per preservation of the, an official religion. In pre-Christian Scandinavia and even post-Christian among several rural communities, religion was composed by a series of belief systems always changing and evolving and adapting to the new circumstances and constantly adding new elements from other religions. So it's not easy to understand how people actually worshipped Thor or any other pagan deity in the north. Archaeology is very useful, of course, but at the end of the day, it's a hard work of interpretation and coming about certain conclusions based on comparison with other sources. And I speak this from experience. Uh, it's a long and hard interdisciplinary work, but unfortunately, human thought and perceptions towards the religious and the supernatural doesn't remain. People die. <laughs> Mythology, of course, uh, much of it holds explanations of ritual behavior, as I said, but again, the largest source on Norse mythology is the Prose Edda, written by the Icelandic historian Snorri Sturluson in the 13th century. However, being a Christian in a period 200 years already after Catholicism had become the official religion of Iceland, and being religiously, culturally, and geographically far from the Nordic pagan past, Snorri wasn't trying to re record these accounts to preserve the pagan religious past, as his 
retellings of the pagan tales are full of elements that have been purposely purged of virtually almost all their religious contents. Still, there are some clues and ideas we can come about, but perhaps we fall more into the realms of speculation rather than hitting the truth of it. However, there's an important account called Herbia Saga, which tells of the early colonization of Iceland during the 10th and the 11th centuries, precisely when the um, earliest accounts about Norse myths had been created again by Icelanders, but still in a period and uh, they themselves having been a little bit closer to the pagan mentality and many of these people having been both pagans and Christian all at once and being very much aware of both the pagan and the Christian religious men mentality as it is attested by the source, the wonderful source, Voluspa, written around this period, 10th century, probably. Still, Heribigya Saga is one of the very, very few accounts that show us a rare description of a pagan temple. It tells us of a building which had in it the posts of the high seat, the Honvegistudur, the high seat pillars, which had nails understood to be divine nails. And at the far end of the temple, there was a chamber and in the middle of the floor, a stand like an altar, and on it lay an harm ring upon which people swore their oaths. And on this stand also stood a bowl with the blood of the sacrifice and a twig that served as a sprinkler, precisely used to sprinkle the blood of the sacrificed animals. And, and this twig is even compared in the source itself, compared to the holy water sprinkle. In fact, <laughs> the entire description of this temple often uses comparisons with the church structure and other elements within Catholicism. Well, this stand or this altar served as the holy place around which the images of the gods were set out. So we know people swore oaths upon an arm ring in the presence of the gods, or at least in the presence of the representations of the gods, and the blood of the sacrificed animals sprinkled like holy water, as it says in the, in the source itself, and, and, and pinning nails on the high seat pillars, which we know from other sources to be one of the most important uh, parts or archi architectonical parts of the temples, the very parts of the structure that Icelanders took with them into Iceland, bringing with them, literally, from the old temples back in, co in the continent, bringing these pillars. So, so, there are a lot of elements in here that resemble Christianity and, and, the, and the source itself compares several things with Christianity itself, from the nails, the sprinkling of blood, like holy water, a specific chamber in the, in the same shape as a church chancel, the altar with the figures uh, as it is often also encountered in churches, the several figures of saints. Yes, there may be already in here, in here a strong Christian religious presence, as Christianity was already known at least to the Danes since the 6th century and the, and the 7th centuries, uh, the 6th and the 7th centuries, maybe earlier than that. However, we must not forget that these elements we see depicted in this account may resemble Christian religious elements, and uh, that's perfectly understandable, actually, because these elements, in part, are influenced from or, or by several religious uh, expressions of pagan Rome. The sprinkling or the, the sprinkler of holy water and the drinking wine as the blood of Christ, are Christian substitutes for the Roman pagan religious performances and cultic behavior, sprinkling blood and bathing on the blood of the sacrificed bull. So, in this Icelandic account, we may very well be in the presence of a religion already influenced by Christianity, or some of its elements having been influenced by uh, the pagan Romans in an earlier period, as 
the Roman Empire did have a tremendous influence upon continental Germanic peoples. That's precisely how runes were introduced to the Germanic peoples, the old Germans from the Iron Age, for instance, as an example. Or we may be in the presence of, of pagan elements, still, of course, as animal and human sacrifice and sprinkling of blood, drinking it and bathing in it, is something we see on several ancient cultures and societies, even in pre-Roman cultures. So this account simply shows the same pattern as always, cultural syncretism and syncretic faiths, which is something very much human. Keep adding several elements and, and building a religious approach and, and, and continue to add more elements in order to strengthen and, and to facilitate the contact between humans and the supernatural. So this would have been part of the cult of Thor as well. Thor was, as I said, by far one of the most important deities in Scandinavia in the Viking, in the end of, by the end of the Viking period. So surely his figure would be one of those included in this temple, as it has been before in the pagan temples of uh, southern Sweden. For instance, when the cult of Thor and Odin were brought into Sweden, and eventually these two deities were immediately added to the cult of Freud. And in temples, it was usually these three that were represented. But again, Thor was the most popular, and it was precisely the high seat pillars with the depiction of Thor that were carried into Iceland by the Norwegian colonizers. And these high seat pillars thrown overboard to let Thor decide where the newcomers should settle by waiting to see where the high seat pillars with the image of Thor carved on, the, on them would wash ashore. I hope you, were, you have read the notes concerning this. The high seat pillars were one of the most, if not the most important part of a house or a temple. The very heart of the household in which, at least some of them, the images of Thor had been carved. I wouldn't risk saying it's a sort of totem, although in its original sense it may have been understood as something close or similar to it, to, 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 to that, the conception of a totem. But certainly the very structure that holds the entire house is important. It is the very thing that holds the place where people had shelter, felt protected, felt at home, where they constituted their families and lived their lives and had their most intimate affairs. And the very place where they contacted with the gods and performed their rituals and displayed their cults towards their belief systems. So the household and temples would have been considered a small representation of the realm of the living, but also the microcosmos, so to speak. As such, the pillars were fundamental to hold the entire structure and, and, and makes sense carving the image of Thor on the pillars, a god of protection, the god of the people, the god with whom people felt secure and, and were more familiar with. The only Nordic deity whose affairs involved a lot more contact with humanity, and Thor fighting giants is the protective aspect of this deity to protect humanity against the natural elements which might destroy their microcosmos, their household, their temples, and the places important to the livelihood of these people. So it makes sense the first Icelandic colonizers and settlers carrying with them the high seat pillars of households and temples, with the images of Thor carved on them and throwing them overboard at the site of Iceland, and let Thor decide where they should settle. Let their beloved god of protection choose a place to settle. And why is that? Because Iceland was a completely new place, unfamiliar. Who knows what sort of land spirits Jotnar, Troll, and other supernatural beings are native to this land. 
Thor is the protector. Thor fights these beings precisely. So he would have to be the very first to make contact with this new unfamiliar land and contact with its invisible persons or population, both the visible and the invisible others. As such, Thor chooses a proper place to settle, a place deemed to be safe before humans set foot on the island, Iceland. And you might be thinking, uh, but the Icelanders would also take out or hide the monsters carved on the prow of their ships to avoid causing fear to the land spirits. Yes, indeed, and that's precisely it. These were people still with an animistic mentality to a certain extent, even though some were Christians and others were both pagan and Christian all at once, the pagan mentality was yet present, that is, their animistic perceptions of realities were still present. Not all land spirits are harmful, and they, the, the people, humans, needed those to fertilize the soils. They need certain native invisible others to keep taking care of the land, to have bountiful harvests, to have protection, to create all sorts of beneficial and uh, symbiotic relationships with these spirits to have quality of life in this new unfamiliar land and to survive in it. However, not all invisible and visible others have a willing nature to make relationships with these humans. So let Thor go first, arrange things around, see where it is fit to land and settle. It's all a question of building relationships between the known and unknown persons of the world, be those visible or invisible others, the visible and invisible populations. As I've pointed out, Thor became the most popular deity in Scandinavia by the end of the Viking Age. But then you ask, but Arith, how do we know he became the most popular? And I'll tell you. There are a lot of historical and archaeological evidences that show that, and that's it. <laughs> Let's name only a few today, right? Thor's hammer, for instance, Mjolnir, one of the most used iconographic representations of a deity, were necklaces representing Thor's hammer. It was by far the most used object in direct relation with a deity. However, representations of Thor's hammer first appear, as I said, in Saxon context, as a response towards Christianity. Right, uh, not a response as some sort of holy war between paganism and Christianity, as some neo-pagan also through religious organizations like to, to paint, not at all. Thor's hammer coincides with the period in which the Carolingian Empire extended into Saxon lands. And so the northern continental Germanic peoples were in close contact with Christianity. But conquering territories isn't solely through war, but also bargaining, trading, giving lands and titles, conversion to a new religion. Thor's hammer appears as a response towards Christianity because the old Saxons and the Danes eventually saw the cross of Christ around the neck of Christians, a representation of Jesus Christ as a much beloved figure and the religion and, and turning around this very figure. The Christian God was considered to be the only true God for Christians, and Jesus, well, of course, depending on the Christian set, either his son or God himself on earth, nevertheless the most important religious figure to Christians. But to the Danes, to the pagan Danes, Christ was yet another God. And like all pagans, many gods were incorporated, adopted or added to the set of gods people held in their religious beliefs. So Christ was accepted or added by many Germanic pagans as yet another god. This, of course, before things started to change and take a whole other scenery and Christianity began to be forced upon pagans. Okay, 
before this. But before Christianity was officially accepted or forced as the official religion in Northern Europe, many Germanic pagans had already adopted Christ as yet another god. Some were fully converted, others were both pagan and Christian all at once. Religious syncretism and syncretic faiths was always easy for pagans. Having a larger number of gods was just beneficial. The more the merrier, more benefits. And Christ was yet another god of protection among many Saxon and Dane and, 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 and Dan Danish gods. That's when Thor's hammer came to be as a physical rep representation to be wore around one's neck. These Germanic peoples, upon seeing the, the cross, the Christian cross, around the necks of the Christians with whom they traded, but also among themselves, on those who had already adopted Christ, well, they felt the need to show their own beloved God as well, the one more popular and the one they turned to more often, and that was Thor. In the Germanic pagan mentality, of the late Iron Age and, and early Middle Ages, Christ was the beloved God of Christians, and so Germanic pagans also wanted to show the sign of their beloved God, Thor. And Thor's hammer became one of the most used symbols in this period as jewelry, as a response towards Christianity. Some people may think that before Christianity was forced onto, pagan, onto the Germanic pagans, that everyone was pagan and, and, and what I've just said about some pagans converting or being both pagan and Christian is just absolute gibberish. However, it's important to remember that Denmark was aware of Christianity since at least the 6th century, maybe even earlier. And that, is, and that in Norway, King Håkon I was trying to force Christianity onto the remaining pagans since the 10th century. And the 11th century marks the acceptance of Catholicism, finally, as the official religion in both Sweden and Iceland. So, some would think that this is when Germanic pagans began to be Christian. However, archaeology shows us a very different religious panorama, a religious scenery. In many Viking Age graves, as early as the 8th and 9th centuries, already present several evidences of Christian material culture. Some people were already being buried with the Christian cross or and both Christian and pagan religious material cultures. Uh, material culture. <laughs> It's in there. The graves don't lie. People may be dead, but the dead have plenty to tell. And when they start speaking, they will never shut up. So Thor's hammer was a religious response towards Christianity, not in a context of a holy war. That's just ridiculous. But simply as a appreciation for another culture and religion from the part of the pagans. Pagans were never... Like Christians, their mentality was more open-minded, so to speak, and they did accept many different religions and gods and religious conceptions because it was just beneficial to have more deities to turn to in times of great need. In fact, I remember, um, let me show you here, uh, somewhere in here, the soapstone molds found in Denmark to cast both Thor's hammers and Christian cross, crosses in the same period. They were being made at the same time for pagans, for Christians, and for those who were pagans and Christians. The appearance of Thor's hammer, the physical iconography, coincides precisely with the Christian cross pendants spreading throughout Europe at the same time. And in Scandinavia, both Thor's hammer and Christian cross pendants were being made together between the 9th and the 11th centuries. And this religious syncretism is also found in many rune stones, which display a mixture of scenes from Norse myths and images of the gods 
alongside crucifixion and other biblical motifs and scenes, all merged together. The Viking Age doesn't mark a deep development of pagan religious motifs in the North. It actually marks a deep contact with several cultures and adopting several different cultural aspects, including religious motifs, making a, ri a rich mixture of several cultural aspects that enriched people's daily lives, gave them quality of life. And the other, uh, other evidences of the great importance of Thor and him uh, having become the most popular of, of the gods in the north, we find evidences of it in the Flete Jarbo, which is an Icelandic text which tells us of the importance of the thunder god, as his image in temples had a special place of honor alongside Odin and Freyr. However, Thor's image was always the larger one, and adorned with gold and silver, standing out from all the other representations of deities. This account coincides with the 11th century account of Adam of Bremen, who also describes the temple at the Swedish capital of Gamla Uppsala, uh, where Thor is alongside Freud and Odin. In Sweden, Freud remains an, uh, an important deity, al although his cult was considerably overshadowed by the cults of Odin and Thor. Odin being the god of the elite, whilst Thor, the popular god, of all the other social classes outside nobility and royalty. Although Thor was also important to those uh, social groups as well. But in terms of temples, the evidences are too few, and occasionally one is found, which, which is a very rare finding, as temples were not that common in pre-Christian Scandinavia, but they did exist nonetheless. However, archaeological evidences concerning uh, the cult of the gods in context of temples doesn't exist. So, on those terms, we must rely on the written sources. But without a doubt, Thor's hammer remains the most significant material culture that stands as a testimony to the popularity of Thor. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video. I hope it was useful. And as I said, this video today was just an introduction to Thor. Several uh, important points uh, discussed here today, I shall develop them in more depth in the near future, a deeper analysis concerning several cultic behaviors and even animistic relationships uh, towards Thor. So don't worry, I shall develop a lot more in the future. So once again, I hope you have enjoyed this video. I hope it was useful. <laughs> don't uh, miss the next episode. I, I certainly won't. I will be here for you as always. So, thank you so much for watching. <laughs> See you on the next video. And as always, thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje.